I'm Eric Marcus, and this is Making Gay History. In my first round of interviews for my book, I only spoke to one person who was a household name, Dear Abby. She was also known as Abigail Van Buren. Her given name was Pauline Esther, and her nickname was Popo. And my grandma was just one of 110 million people every day around the world who read what Dear Abby had to say. When I was a kid, my mom sent me to Ziggy's, the corner candy store, to get the Sunday newspapers. They were really heavy. My favorite part of the paper was the comics. My immigrant grandmother went right to Dear Abby's column, where she could get the latest advice on everything from marriage and children to abortion and homosexuality. Abby never minced words. Binding humor was her weapon of choice. But whatever the topic, her warmth and her compassion and her common sense wisdom came through loud and clear. Abby began writing her column in 1956. From the start, she got letters asking for advice on homosexuality, from gay people who wanted to change to parents who wanted to know what they did wrong. Abby did something no other famous public person did. She said positive things about gay men and women and homosexuality in general. That earned her bags of hate mail and a place in the hearts of gay people everywhere. Dear Abby is my personal hero. So, not surprisingly, I am a bit starstruck as I pull into Abby's driveway in Beverly Hills and then walk up to the front door of her French provincial mini mansion. I ring the bell, Abby opens the double height front door and greets me with a welcoming smile. She is tiny, maybe five feet tall. She's dressed in lavender hostess pajamas and pink fluffy slippers. Her hair is perfectly coiffed, her complexion is flawless. We take a seat at the bar in Abby's living room a selection of her old newspaper columns cover the marble counter. My hands shake a bit. Thankfully, I remember to press record. Well, I want to get all that stuff out of storage. I want that stuff in my office where I can put my hands on it. I don't care if it's 1956. Okay? Thanks, honey. Carry on, babe. Bye. That's Jimmy. What a trick. He used to be a Catholic priest. <laughs> He's now in my office, and he's fabulous. Uh-huh. Jimmy Hughes, mm-hmm. he's a darling. May I attach this to you? I don't want to. Uh... Sure. Do you prefer uh, to be called Mrs. Van Buren, Abby? Abby, Abby, Abby. Abby. Okay. When you um, first started writing your column in 1956, did you get letters concerning the issue of homosexuality or lesbianism? There, yeah, I did. How, how can I change? What can I do to change? Even in 1956, you got that kind of. Oh yeah. These are, oh, let's see. I'm trying to. These are the ones I got late on. I to find the early one. Uh, this is an early one. Uh, Dear Abby, to get right to the point, I'm gay, but I don't like being gay. I want a wife, children, and a normal social life. I also have a career I enjoy greatly in banking, in which further advancement is impossible if it becomes known that I'm gay. Psychiatrists and other therapists I've gone to have tried to help me adjust my homosexuality rather than help me to change. Abby, adjusting to being homosexual is fine for those who have accepted their homosexuality, but I haven't. I know I'd be happy or straight. Please help me. He signs unhappy in Houston. I say, dear unhappy, did you choose to be homosexual? If so, then you can choose to be straight. But if you have always had erotic feelings for men instead of women, then face it, you are homosexual. And even though you may be able to change your behavior, you will not be able to change your feelings. Some therapist insists that if a homosexual is sufficiently motivated, He or she can become straight. Maybe so, but the chances are slim. Marrying and having children may make you happier, but what about the other people you involve? To thine own self be true. Only then will you find true happiness. Did you ever hear of Franz Alexander? No, I haven't. Franz Alexander was called father of psychosomatic medicine. He was born in Budapest. And he was the head of the uh, Chicago Institute for Psychoanalysis. He died in 64. He was a very charming, wonderful guy, a very good friend of my husband's and, and mine. He said regarding homosexuality, of course there is no cure because it's not a disease. 
Alexander said this. Yeah, he said there is no cure. This is where I got my notions originally. How far back does that date? Maybe 1945, 1946, I think around that time. But he gave me a lot of my ideas. He really educated me. That was a rather radical way of thinking in those it days. It certainly was. It was, it was dangerous in some circles. Why was it dangerous? It mm -hmm. took courage to come out and say, what do you mean sick? These people aren't. This is natural for them. This is the way they go naturally. You know, I've known a lot of gay people. And you can change one's behavior, but you can't change your feelings. And all these crazy stories that you hear about how they got that way. Mm -hmm. I, I've always thought people were born that way. You must have known people who were gay at that time then, personally. Yeah. Well, my hairdresser, he's like a brother, and he did my hairdresser for about maybe 29 years. He came from Louisville, Nebraska. Beautiful guy and just a sweetheart. And uh, he had to leave a little town of Louisville because, uh, well, he just couldn't survive there. I've taken him to Korea with me when I was a Miss uh, a Universe pageant judge. We had just had a ball. He and I are in a helicopter. Have you ever been in a helicopter? Thank God, no. Okay. <laughs> And Cloyd is his name of all things. Cloyd? Cloyd. But he's not really Nelly, but he's not all that subtle. So we're in this helicopter. These are all big army guys, you know. And we go up, you know, and then back. And I, his purse slid back. That's why I said to the, hey, hold it. I said, my friend lost his purse. As the guy broke up in the front. <laughs> The guy that was driving the helicopter you know, just cracked up. Knowing someone like that from that part of the country, yeah. I, I would think it would have given you some insight then into what it was like for young kids growing up in, in small towns who were gay. Did you That's ever it. talk about... Oh, yeah. Oh, certainly, certainly. Never came out to his parents. And he said they, just could, they couldn't handle that. His mother just adored him, and he was a wonderful son. Just a wonderful son. You were probably the only voice out there at that time. And I imagine you received lots of letters from homosexuals, men and women, uh, with questions. And, and parents of gay people, too. Because of them, it was, where we've gone wrong? I had to tell you, you didn't go wrong. Just love him, love him, love him. That's it. How did your paper let you get away with it? Lots of papers complained, but they never dropped me. The San Diego Union had never published the word homosexual in their newspaper when I started. I was, the, I was a breakthrough, and they're still pretty conservative, but that was the first time they'd ever published the word homosexual, you know, unless, unless they dragged a guy, and this guy was going to jail or something, but in a column. Right. I mean, and to be kindly toward a homo, to be understanding. It seems things really heated up in the, the early 70s for you. There was a column I came across um, in which a... Uh, you write rather strongly. In 1971, you wrote, to those who wrote to blast me for my refusal to put down the homosexual, the most burdensome problem the homosexual must bear is the stigma placed upon him by an unenlightened and intolerant society. Their sexual bent is as natural and normal for them as uh, ours is for us. And then you talk about they, are t they too are God's children. It seems that my impression was that things began to heat up. In, in that issue, the homosexuality issue, in the late 60s, early 70s. Uh, mm -hmm. That's when gay civil rights came into bloom. Did you, ta did you come under more attacks during that time for your comments? Or did you just get a steady stream of, of hate? It was a years? steady stream of hate. Every time I'd run something, a compassionate or sympathetic, I would get a lot. I get hate. It didn't bother me, but I got a lot of it. But I, I have made that statement. Mm -hmm. God made uh, uh, gays as well as he made straights. I've said that because that's the way I feel. I think I've always been bold. I never fudged, I never apologized, and I got a lot of, my Lord, I tell you, the Bible thumpers really let me have it. I was getting Leviticus and Corinthians and Proverbs, I was getting all that stuff. And uh, you're not gonna change their mind because they're fanatics. Mm -hmm. They can't help it because they're, this is the way they believe, and fine, that's okay with me. But don't tell me what to believe. And the biblical injunctions mean nothing to me, because you can find all kinds of contradictions in the Bible. You can find anything you want in the Bible. If it makes people behave better, fine. But if it makes people less understanding of their fellow man, then, then something is wrong, you see. Your belief should make you better and should make you kind.
kinder, not more hateful. How did you handle the, the negative mail? Wasn't it upsetting to you in, in some way? Well, yeah, I guess it was upsetting, but it saddened me that people could be so unfeeling and ignorant. Mm -hmm. What sorts of things did they say to you? Do you oh, recall? about a bird in hell, you know, oh yes, yes. Really? Oh, sure. The fundamentalist types would say that. You should be saved. People want to show me the light. They think I'm misguided. And they say, oh, you're a good Christian woman. I always write back and say, thank you, you're very kind, but I, I hope I'm a good Jewish person because I am Jewish. I always let them know that. Mm -hmm. There was a, a column that, that you wrote. Uh, this is the woman who complained about the new neighbors next door, a strange man and a couple. Well, the letter was, this is a nice neighborhood, and uh, we're very disgusted with the, these types. And what could we do to improve the neighborhood? And my answer was, you could move. The gays thought it was hilarious. Other than just being amusing, entertaining, there was a good message there. Which was? Which was, was they have a right to be. If you don't like it, you could move. Because they have as much right to be them as you have to be yourself. Mm -hmm. How much of an impact do you think you've had as one person on this issue? Uh, I think I was the, well, I would say the first, I was one of the first person on a national level that wasn't gay, I wasn't defending myself, I was defending everyone's right to be themselves, gay, straight, no matter. And that was in the 19, beginning of the 1950s? It, was, it took, people tell me it took a lot of guts, but I was happy to have a platform such as I had. Were you at all concerned that your views on this subject would, would harm your career? Because at the time you wrote, 1950s, 1960s, even to the 70s. I had an awful lot of people who, uh, who thought I was wrong. Why should I stick my neck out for them, you know? That didn't bother me. It didn't, I didn't, I've never lost a paper that I know of because of this. Where does the courage come from? I don't know. <laughs> Eric actually helped me, I can't tell you. Uh -huh. But it must have been there, it was there all the time. Mm -hmm. I got a lot of love letters as well as hate, have hate letters. Oh. And that's, that keeps me going. Uh -huh. Those are the ones you read? I read them all. Uh -huh. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, it's been a pleasure talking Eric, about this. A pleasure. And I wish you much success with your book. I know it's going to be good. You ask good questions. Thank you. Soon after I interviewed Abby, she introduced me to her daughter, Jeannie. We became fast friends. Jeannie took over the Dear Abby column from her mom in 2002, and like her mom, she's been a fierce ally to gay people and a champion of LGBT rights. Jeannie's mother died on January 16, 2013. She was 94. If you've never seen a picture of Abigail Van Buren, Jeannie's mom, have a look at the iconic photo from the mid-1960s I posted at makinggayhistory.com. I don't know about you, but when I look at that photo, I can't imagine not taking her advice. I've got a few key people to thank for making this podcast possible. Thank you to our executive producer, the hardworking Sarah Burningham, our audio engineer, Casey Holford, and our composer, Fritz Myers. Thank you also to our social media guru, Hannah Moak, our webmaster, Jonathan dozer Ezel, and Zachary Seltzer, the man responsible for each episode's show notes. We had production help from Jenna Weiss-Berman, who believed in this podcast even before it was a podcast. Making Gay History is a co-production of Pineapple Street Media with assistance from the New York Public Library's Manuscripts and Archives Division. Funding is provided by the Arcus Foundation, which is dedicated to the idea that people can live in harmony with one another and the natural world. Learn more about Arcus and its partners at arcusfoundation.org. And if you like what you've heard, please subscribe to Making Gay History on iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. You can also listen to all our episodes on makinggayhistory.com. That's where you'll find photos and information about each of our interview subjects. So long, until next time.